Hello, I'm Larry Berkelhammer. I'm here with Dr. Eric Pepper, one of the foremost people in the world in the field of psychophysiological self-regulation. Welcome, Eric. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, thank you. I would like to take this opportunity to ask you about the frontier of psychophysiologic self-regulation. Throughout history, there have been people who've, who've explored this. Uh, there was a period, I think, in the 1970s and 80s, they called themselves cybernauts. And then, of course, cyber was taken over by the internet. But um, who are the, the biggest named people you can think of throughout history who have really pushed at the frontier in what's possible in altering physiologic functioning with the mind? Well, there, there are multiple themes in that answer. One, you could look at the yogis historically, the, the fakirs who laid on beds of nails, who stuck skewers through their bodies, who walked through fire. Many of the spiritual traditions, ranging from the Sufis to the American Indians, where you do a sun ceremony hanging from hooks, show in fact that you can have voluntary control, that somehow in a certain emotional state you may not feel pain, you may not have bleeding, you may not have infection. Mm -hmm. So those are that's one history. Right, yeah. In a more narrowing field called biofeedback and applied psychophysiology, there are two or three different historical schools. So one would be the world, I would say, of Elmer and Elise Green. I think they were really one of the most remarkable forerunners. They blended, they came out of the awareness of yoga uh, and Eastern perspectives and then taught, combined almost like autogenic training and ways to have voluntary control. They were the seeds for people, the treatment of migraine, of hypertension and even uh, addictive work. Then you have the work, you could classically say, of Neil Miller, who was mm -hmm. in, first at, at Yale, then at Rockefeller University, who showed that you could have voluntary control. He did the work with the rats initially. Uh, with Karari, so that's one time. Then in, in muscle work, you have to work by Watmore and Coley. I think they were truly on the frontier. They are people who started first, before there was anything. When were they? They were in the 50s and 60s. They started in the 60s and they developed the concept of dysponesis, misdirected efforts. So when you're working at the computer, for example, your shoulders are up, you don't know it. They would monitor and they identified about eight different muscle groups they would monitor in this. Now this is before biofeedback machinery. Correct, they used this very big equipment and he had a, a shielded room where the patients would sit and he would do treatment of depression, anxieties, all different ones and had some remarkable outcomes. So notice that's all different themes. You can think of the work by Barry Sturman mm -hmm. at UCLA who did the work with epilepsy. I can think in Massachusetts with uh, Thomas Mulholland who did work in EEG and then the work I did myself in respiratory patterns. Mm -hmm. You can think of people like Dick Gewurz who are at uh, Alliant University uh, in San Diego has done most remarkable work. And Paul Lehrer with him. Well, Paul Lehrer is in, in, in New Jersey. In New Jersey, but... Yes, Paul has done the work with the heart rate variability and the work of asthma. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are a number of different people who have done it. Remember, history varies. History depends who tells it mm -hmm. and who survived. So you were one of the, on the frontier too. I remember uh, I wasn't interested in biofeedback, didn't even know about it then, but when did you get your start? I started, in fact, in 1967, uh, purely for an opportunity to work in the lab or be with the lab of Thomas Mulholland, who was one of the most remarkable, I think, researchers, mentors, and very generous. So he really allowed me to truly play, and I mean that, explore in the lab. And I'll never, I mean, I'm truly forever grateful to him for the major reason is that here, imagine he is a researcher, I'm a first year graduate student, I go to his lab at the VA, he meets with me, he gives me a pile of books to read or articles to read, I read them, I don't understand them at all. Uh, I come back and eventually he invites me that I could be in his lab, eventually we work together, I start developing with him new ideas, we did, we published papers and but it's most remarkable, he really had very little ego, no ego. He was truly a, a discoverer. And so in almost all labs, I would say if you're a first year graduate student, 
I mean, you publish a paper, the paper would always be the, the head of the research lab, then the assistants, and probably my role almost being a psych assistant would have been a note, footnote at the bottom. Mm -hmm. In fact, you know, I did this work, he, he allowed me just to be first author. Wow. Which is, you know, we publish these in Kybernetic, and I think he... Kybernetic? In a journal called Kybernetic. K-Y? Yes. Uh, uh, many of these articles, the early work we did in, in biofeedback, was now called biofeedback. And then out, out of that work, I moved to the West Coast, and there I got really intrigued continuously in respiratory patterns. So I have I contributed a tiny bit to bring the importance of respiratory patterns, how important they are for our health. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, you can apply this, the concepts to peak performance to many other places. So oh, who, are the, who are the frontiers? It depends which field you ask. You can think of peak performance of Sue Wilson who is remarkable. So there are hundreds of different names. Yeah. You once told me that you were somewhere in the tropics and you had your, you got a bad cut on your toe and the, the pad of the toe was actually severed from the rest of the toe and you sewed it back on yourself with a sewing needle and no anesthetic. Well, this was in, in uh, Baja, uh, Baja, we were scuba diving and I walked up a little ladder and I cut off the pad of my toe. It was really just hanging there. And so I could either lose it. So then with a, a colleague of mine, we just took regular needles. We, we, and with a regular thread. These are so sewing needles. So regular sewing needles. Yeah. And with a thread, sewed back that piece on. You know, I would say I was not as skilled as, as either Jack Swartz or as Kawakami. But basically, if I relaxed, if I exhale, and then you do the pain, the pain is significantly attenuated. Remember, if you take control, pain is totally different. Did you consider getting an over-the-counter anesthetic? Well, it would be nice, except you're in the middle of nowhere. Oh. <laughs> I either had an option to get rid of that piece of flesh yeah. or to sew it on. We were yeah. truly four or ten hours away from anywhere yeah. to do it so it was the obvious thing just to do to to have it so to sew it on and that was the but i remember this in a different way let me give us an example and then i'll stop on that i remember being once in this office that's after having studied these unusual people and i closed the door and my nail got caught inside my, my thumb got caught inside the frame and i closed the door at that moment, I, I'll, I remembered how we had worked with Kawakami and Jack Swartz. And I remember vividly at that moment, just I could feel this pulse coming up, almost like intense and no meditation, where you think of a thought as a bubble coming up. Mm. I could, and at that moment, I did the inverse. I relaxed. I really relaxed. It didn't deter me from then opening the door and taking my thumb out, by the way. <laughs> And then, instead of being angry with myself, instead of being judgmental, I was just like a mother kissing her child's toe who was hurt. I just kissed it with a sense of deep tenderness to be with that injured part. Right. I, I, and what was so interesting, I used to be able to lecture and have this nail with a big dimple in it grow slowly out where you could see the trauma. It never even turned black and blue. Now I know it's not a scientific study. I should have taken my other thumb, slammed right. the door, <laughs> tightened, and then do a comparative study. Yeah, that's we, what any re respectable scientist would Well, we did do that study differently with one of my students at one time in voluntary, pain, voluntary control. We had a student who had learned to warm his and her hand so much they could warm one hand eight degrees more than the other. And cool the other. And, and cool the other, and on demand. Right. And for the, what he did, did for his independent study at one time, which I luckily didn't know anything about until after he did, he went home for his research, and then he cut his index fingers oh. very deeply. Wow. He took pictures of it, and then for the next week, he voluntarily warmed one hand and not the other. So he kept his hand mentally warm, and he really could do that. And then he brought his fingers back to class. I'll never forget that. They were still attached. Yes, yes, obviously. <laughs> and then you could see the one he had really warmed had totally healed and the other one was still open. It's true. Maybe wow. he had cheated. I don't That's think he did. Scientist. But he, he, we did publish that. He published that as a little study. Huh. And I'm totally persuaded that if I can really relax and at that moment allow a sense of blood flow to go through that's what i do with that sense of tenderness by being with right. taking away all the fear at least you initiate healing much more mm -hmm. and that's really what the mother does when a child falls yeah. 
it, it looks at, you know, it may cry, and what does the mother do? It kisses the owie. Sure. But and, we tend not to do that for ourselves. Well, you know, you have learned a new skill. Next time you hurt your toe, quickly find the first person and say, please give it a kiss. <laughs> <laughs> I, I want to thank you for discussing this, and we can continue this discussion in our next interview. Thank My pleasure. So Thanks so much. Sure.